G'day, welcome. Um, I have the honor today to introduce Jeff Williams. Jeff is one of the major founders of OWASP and he actually, with uh, Dave Wickers, helped establish and gave a home to the OWASP Foundation from its very earliest days. And we would not be here today um, without Jeff and all of his contributions over a very long period of time, including the very first OWASP Top 10 in 2003. So, hi Jeff, welcome. Hey Andrew, thanks for having me. So the reason we're here is you've got a distinguished lifetime membership because of the 20 years of work that you've been doing for OWASP. Do you want to just sort of tell us a bit about your contributions, some of the highlights, some of the lowlights, and uh, let's take it from there. Well, first I'd like to thank you for the uh, the lovely award. I think it's uh, it's pretty cool stuff. Uh, so it's got a, a place on my mantle here, which is nice. Um, yeah, I always liked OWASP. I mean, uh, I got into it really early. Uh, the team there was just building an OWASP guide. Uh, if you remember the very early days, it was, you know, it was a document. And uh, I, uh, they, they were starting to talk about building an online training environment for AppSec, which I had already built for the courses that I was teaching, at, uh, AppSec courses I was teaching at the company I was at. Um, and so I just decided to donate WebGoat to OWASP. And it got such a great response. I felt really good about it. Like people seemed to really enjoy it. And uh, it was, it was really good. So I just, I got kind of addicted to contributing to OWASP, which is, uh, it was great for my career. It was great for my personal development and, uh, you know, I built a lot of great relationships. So, you know, I think that's the kind of benefit that you can personally get from OWASP while mm -hmm. doing something good for the world. Absolutely. And I'm, I want to echo that. Not only did you guys give me an opportunity to work for you, whilst I was the OWASP top 10 leader, um, I also have got my dream job because of all the work that I've done for OWASP over the years, you know, starting mm. with the developer guide. Um, honestly, contributing pays itself back tenfold. So I do encourage people to get involved. Yeah, I like so, it. I had a bunch of projects that really took off, like the top 10 and, uh, you know, WebGoat really went, went fantastic. A bunch of other projects uh, did pretty well. Uh, ISAPI and ASBS and things like that. And some projects never really got any traction at all, like the OWASP legal project and a few others, which I thought were, I thought could have been really interesting, but uh, you know, never really captured the, the public imagination. So fun fact, I actually did get a quote from the lawyers to update your software contract annex, because um, I think that's a really important thing with the software supply chain executive order. Um, and having something available for at least the US uh, legal context would be something incredible. Um, I do want to move on that soon. So if you're ever interested, I know you've got a lawyer as a background. Uh, <laughs> um... <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, let's talk about that. I mean, yeah, I think it's interesting. Maybe I'll, I'll decide that project wasn't a failure. It was just ahead of its time. I think so. Probably <laughs> uh, what you, you did that in 2011, I think, or? Oh man, I have no idea. Somewhere, yeah, it was over a decade ago for sure. Yeah, and so the US government's only just released an executive order around secure supply chain, and now we need this. <laughs> yeah, I'm so, really excited about the EO. I think there's a lot of good stuff in there. I'm a little concerned about what NIST is doing to implement the order, but uh, I'm, I'm working with them to try to push them in the right direction. Yeah, um, I was sitting on the software assurance um, thing, and I was basically trying to amplify your signal and the times you were talking, quite frankly, I don't think it was getting through to some of them. They were just, you know, sh bike shedding around compiler flags and things like that, that I don't think really moved the industry forward. I think when, when you know, the things you were saying, in fact, I think that might be an interesting, just very interesting topic. Because I think one of the things that people may not realize is just how innovative you've been over this entire time. I mean, ES API was the beginning of the secure frameworks movement. And it obviously had a genesis in the 2005, 2007 timeframe. So do you want to just quickly go through um, like the ASVS? Yeah. I mean, that's another project you started that I currently co-lead and it's an amazing piece of work. Well, it's evolved quite a lot since I was involved with it, but you know, the ideas are simple here. There's not rocket science, you know, building an OS top 10 was kind of the obvious thing to do. If you really think about what's going to move the market mm -hmm. and ASVS to me was like, you know, let's get a standard set of requirements out there and we can't do all the requirements, you know, for every little nitinoid thing, mm -hmm. but let's get the most important ones. And my, in my version of ASVS, we, we limited ourselves to 10. 
-hmm. in each category. We said, hey, let's get the top 10 authentication requirements. So it's kind of like taking the OWASP top 10 and then driving it down like the next order of magnitude to get those requirements down. And, uh, you know, the project's moved along uh, quite well, I think. Uh, there's, it's a lot better now in terms of the requirements that are in there. So, you know, I think it's a, it's a good you know, sort of piece of the puzzle. I do, I, my concern is that kind of software development is moving away from requirements as a thing. Like I think security is really waterfall style. And most mm -hmm. of the things that we think of as best practices in AppSec are really doubling down on that waterfall paradigm. And security requirements is like the poster child for that. Yeah. Uh, but there's a lot of other things, you know, architecture and you know, pen testing and like they're all kind of big monolithic things. I really think we need to restructure the work of AppSec in a DevOps way. Little pieces that you can track from beginning to end and measure their delivery into production. Mm. That's, that's the key to future AppSec. So that was one of my major messages to my previous talk, um, which I was just on a panel and I had props. And what I'd like cornucopia. to do is use Cornucopia. Um, I like to give those cards to the developers every sprint and we work out if there's going to be some sort of story that needs one of these cards attached to it. Um, and we use it as an aide to memoir, not as a game, but as, as literally, does this have this problem? And if it does, I attach it. So we're not doing big design up front. We're just making little chips at the actual thing every time. So definitely having a good relationship and working together as a team is much better. Yeah, I think that's right. For me, it's, you know, let's deal with the next biggest, most important security thing as one work item, do that one, and then we'll come back and revisit. We'll figure out what the next biggest thing is. And it could change, you know, the circumstances in the world could change. Yep. I actually do like the fact that you were mentioning that the, uh, the ASVS originally had 10 things in it, but the, the reality is what we're doing is we're with version five, I'd be very happy for you to get back involved. Um, we're wanting to use the OS top 10 data. We have 515,000 apps of data to make level one simple again, because it's too many. At the moment, it's 120 items in version four. If we can get down to say, what are the 10 most important things in each chapter that is data-driven and have a control just for that, and then level one is approachable. Yeah. I think that's, that's a really good design idea. I think that's a really good one. A, I don't know. I'm not I, like I'm. I'm really just not. I'm not pushing the idea of people should have 120 security requirements up front. Frankly, you should not be implementing your own authentication. You should have an authentication mechanism. So there should be one authentication requirement that says use the standard thing, Okta or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, you should have one access control requirement. Yes. Uh, that says you know use our standard enterprise access control solution, and uh, you know uh, that makes it much easier problem to solve. Mm. You're never going to get all those 550,000 projects to actually implement 120 requirements. There's just no way. So um, yeah, just going back to a little bit of the, the fact that you innovated so much, you're actually a very, very early researcher in the IAST field. And obviously you've got a company around that now. Um, do you just want to describe the early days of uh, the IAST work that you and our shame were doing? Oh yeah, so you know we we tried using all the different techniques for application security for many years. We tried SAS, all the different tools there. We tried DAS, all the different approaches there. A little bit with WAFs, uh, just to help our customers. And these are mostly large enterprises with you know thousands of applications. Uh, and you know really the 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 there were just too inaccurate. At the core, I think that's what drove us was the, the lack of accuracy and the amount of human labor it takes to, to use those tools. In fact, they're not really automation. When you get right down to it, if it requires, you know, mostly 80% of the effort is like using, you know, interpreting the, the findings, it's just not really automated. Mm -hmm. And we could see very early that that was never going to scale to the this, this size we needed it. So we were on the lookout for a different way. And we had this idea of if we could get inside the running application, and you worked with us, you know, we did pen test and code review at the same time, trying to figure out what the code was doing inside the running app. Mm -hmm. We had this idea, if we could actually just watch that, then we could be much more accurate about security. And we started uh, 
implementing sensors the way that uh, APM tools work, very similar to what New Relic and AppDynamics do. We instrument the code with sensors that can watch the behavior of the running application. And using that, we can see full vulnerability paths execute. And you know, we generate a trace that says, hey, look, data flows through this path. Let's say for SQL injection, it flows from you know, a request parameter or cookie or form field or something all the way through the application into a SQL query. Maybe it gets chopped up and restructured along the way, but it, when it gets to that SQL query, it hasn't been parameterized or escaped in any way that would have stopped SQL injection. So we know we have a, an exploitable SQL injection path and we report that. And so the first experiments were really exciting. You know, we, when I, it was actually in this house in the couch in the other room where I first saw it work on WebGoat. Uh, and it was super exciting because, you know, you don't have to hack the application. You can just type in like the word Andrew mm. and, and see SQL injection be discovered. And I was like, this is so empowering because now any developer anywhere can find their own security vulnerabilities and fix them accurately without, you know, a team of experts and so on. I got really excited about that. And it's been really interesting watching IAS grow in the market. And now it's becoming, you know, part of the firmament of AppSec. So one of the things that I was watching a, a panel uh, when I was doing the research for the OS Top 10, and one of the, the bywords in uh, one of the large organizations is that they don't give developers tools that have false positives. And I do like the fact that, you know, your tooling doesn't do that. In your 20th anniversary talk, you were talking about shifting wrong. Could you just go through that? Because I think that was actually a really important topic that I loved. And I've actually used it as a context, like a, as a great discussion point with great success. So could you just go through that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think it's absolutely critical that we empower developers to do their own security. Uh, there's just no other machinery in the software ecosystem that big enough and powerful enough to actually do the work required for software security. There's a very small number of security experts out there. So there's been all this talk about shifting left and it, it really draws on just regular QA testing efforts to move QA testing into the developer's purview. But the problem with security is it doesn't shift left cleanly. Like you can't take the the traditional, I'll call them legacy practices of AppSec, uh, you know, doing pen testing and doing static analysis and dynamic scanning, you can't just shift those onto developers because those activities require expertise. Mm. And so uh, if you try and do that, and a lot of organizations try and do that, they just try and push, you know, existing static and dynamic tools down onto development teams you're really creating an untenable situation. That's work that they're not really qualified to do and you're not gonna get good results. In fact, I call it shitting left because you're just <laughs> pushing work onto folks that aren't really qualified. And actually, when you zoom out and look at the big picture, you don't want to shift that work. You really want to spread the work of AppSec across the entire life cycle. Mm. Like there's some that make sense to do really early if you can, but you don't want to give up your double check to make sure that a particular release is fully secured before it goes into production. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of AppSec work that needs to happen in production. And it's not something that OWASP has done a very good job at covering, mm. but really it's because historically only the WAF played there, mm -hmm. but there's a ton of really critical work Organizations need to know who's attacking them. What kind of attack vectors are they using? Which systems are they targeting? We need runtime protection in those environments that can make that visible and also prevent those attacks from actually exploiting vulnerabilities in applications. And most organizations are just kind of completely blind there. WAF data is so noisy because it's measuring security in the wrong place. It's like trying to look at the protocols and figure out if there's an attack in there is just hopeless. And so, you know, uh, that's why I think you really want to shift everywhere, which is actually just sort of spread out. Yeah, the way I look at it is, is that I like to see AppSec teams and uh, development professionals working together, um, learning from each other, and then understanding those challenges. Because I think all too often, the, yeah, AppSec professionals don't often have that context and what they suggest as a solution 
it's just impractical or unnecessary. And yet some of the things that developers need, maybe if the AppSec team heard that, they might actually make some better choices and invest their time differently. And I think that's actually something that we could actually improve on. Well, I think the role of AppSec experts has to change. It mm. can't be that the AppSecs are in, AppSec folks are in the critical path of pushing code into production. Mm. AppSec folks need to change their role to more coach and toolsmith uh, kinds of roles and you know, create that force multiplier, empower the teams to do most of the work, uh, which they can. It's not that complicated. If they have the right, you know, the right instructions and the right guardrails in place, it's not that difficult. Yeah, I mean, I, that's one of the things I was talking about in the panel just before is that getting, building the paved road, building observability to make sure that people understand what components are actually still missing that paved road, but then having guardrails in so that essentially, if they're not using the, um, the paved road, then what are they doing instead? And that observability gives the organization some context as to the risk they're actually maintaining and how do they actually make some changes, um, whether to adopt the paved road or to do something different. Um, I'm glad you used the word observability because I think it's really important and it'll be important over the next decade of, for AppSec. Uh, it's very different than logging or monitoring, you know, like traditional monitoring. And I was a little disappointed to see that the OS top 10, again, kind of doubles down on the paradigm of you should be security logging because it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, there's the no ability to detect attacks in traditional apps, app logs. Uh, you have to build something special and, and teams aren't really doing that. We need really what I would call observability. We need to be able to observe the controls and observe that they are working correctly and identifying attacks and preventing uh, exploits. So we're still working on the PDF version of the OS top 10 and we're still working on translations. So I think there's still a possibility that if you put an issue into the OS top 10 issues, um, we could incorporate the changes like that into the text. It's not impossible at this point to change. I mean, it is mobile friendly and first, but we aren't there yet with a final PDF. Um, we're gonna do a, a wall poster for developers and make that available um, in you know freely printable form and also flyers that we'll have at conferences and whatnot. But the PDF version, will not be the master. The master at the moment is literally the, the mobile friendly version. So there's still scope for us to modify the text. Yeah, I'm probably not going to do that. And the okay. reason is that OWASP has been tremendously unfriendly as a community towards ideas like that. Uh, I campaigned to put uh, the use of insecure libraries into the OWASP top 10 in 2013, put a lot of research into it, did the homework, provided the data, and got excoriated by the community uh, because they thought there was some commercial interest for me in that, which there wasn't. It was, mm. you know, no more part of my business than any of the other top 10. Yeah. I just thought it was the right thing to do. Yeah. Uh, later, I drafted a, a version of the OS top 10 that had something very similar to what I just described. And again, got excoriated by the community. In fact, there was a talk at AppSec uh, USA on stage ridiculing that idea, which to me is, uh, well, yeah. it's, it's destructive to the community. It's embarrassing to, you know, me and frankly, the people that did it. Um, and, you know, it's okay to have a principal discussion about whether something like that should be in there. But, uh, you know, we don't, we should never be attacking people in our community for trying to contribute useful, uh, constructive things to the, to the OS community. So I did have a conversation with those two people afterwards. And the way I said to them is you either need to have better data analysis or you need to have uh, more data than we do. And even back then they didn't have either of those things. So I ignored them. So we did get um, vulnerable in our data components into the old top 10 2017. And there's way more data this time around to support that. So again, I think that demonstrates your uh, innovative credentials that you identified this way earlier the community needed to catch up with you. And I think that's one of the reasons why we've got this distinguished lifetime membership going on. Um, that does bring up the some of the things you'd like to see changing at OS. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, we're not a perfect community. I, I've tried very hard to clean things up um, and I, I've made things less ad hoc um, and got the community to generally agree about our policies. But what would you like to see change? I mean, you led it for a while. 
Yeah, I, I ran it for almost 10 years. Um, and I actually think, you know, well, I, <laughs> I like the way that OS was in the early days. I'm not suggesting that you know you can go back in time and, and create those those startup feel early days uh, in an organization that's now quite a lot bigger. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, I think some of the ideas that we had early were really important, and mm-hmm. we really embodied the idea of a meritocracy. Like mm-hmm. no one was paid. There were no you know I was not paid at all as you know, running OS for ten years. Um, and I was happy to contribute my time to to create the organization, but um, you know I do think that the the need to generate revenue is biasing OWASP's mission, and it's unfortunate. You know, conferences and chapters, uh, you know, were they used to be a way for OWASP folks to get together. Mm-hmm. We charged exactly what the cost of the conference was divided by the number of people attending. <laughs> and there was no effort to make profit or, you know, to, we didn't have to pay any salaries. And, and mm. uh, so it was, it was very easy that way. And it allowed us to, you know, choose to do things that I, I think, you know, didn't have anything to do with, with revenue. Mm. Um, projects that couldn't get done in the commercial space, you know, so in a lot of ways, OS was like an incubator then. And I think ultimately, if you take, if you zoom out and think about, you know, what's going to make a difference in the AppSec market over the next 10 or 20 years, mm. it's not training a bunch of people. There's no possible way that OWASP can train enough people to make a dent. And I'm sorry to say that I like training. I did training for many, many years. Mm-hmm. I like the idea of teaching people about AppSec, but we have to focus on what's going to make a difference. And to me, Nothing in, in AppSec can change until the software market values it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's really, it's fighting upstream. If the software market doesn't value security, doesn't recognize the, the need for it, then it doesn't matter what we do. We can educate a million people about SQL injection and it won't matter because the game is slanted. It's, it's rigged in the popular lingo these days. It's rigged against AppSec. And so... To me, the, the goal of OWASP should be to fix the software market. It's broken, yeah. economically broken. There's, you know, there's economic theories about why that is asymmetric information and so on, but those things can change. It used to be that way for the automobile market. Mm-hmm. And then over 20 or 30 years, that changed so that now you have a lot of information about auto safety. We can do the same thing to AppSec, but we have to focus on that and not on having more conferences. So one of the things that I've um, been doing is I really need just to focus on our mission. We haven't had a new mission statement for a while. And I felt that we weren't having the impact that we were needing to have because we didn't have a lens to focus. And I know you disagree with our new statements, but at the end of the day, what I wanted to do was to start getting OWASP into what I want to call a smaller OWASP. I want to get down to 15% of general overhead so that we can focus the rest on the mission. We need to get to a place where we have a curriculum for universities to teach developers, not AppSec professionals, but developers freely available everywhere. That's something that no one's really going to fund. And we could do it if we had more money, but I don't want more money um, the way we used to do it, which is to just run conferences. COVID showed us that it's not sustainable and I really needed to have more funds coming in from more different places and more parts of the program self-supporting. So the events weren't the reason why OWASP exists. When I joined, I would actually say, OWASP was an events company that happened to have an interest in AppSec. And that wasn't healthy. And what we need to get back to is actually making an impact. And that's what I want. Um, uh, so did I, I, did I hear you correctly? It sounds like you're, you're, the impact you want to make is on students. Well, it's got to be both ends of the supply and demand. We've got to actually get away from this idea that software has no negligence associated with it. The automobile industry, look back at the Ford Pinto, the only reason they changed the Pinto and then made better and um, more realistic designs for bumpers and fuel tank placement is because it actually cost somebody something. 
until we get to the place where the market actually values the fact that secure software is intrinsically better for everybody and that there are penalties for not secure software, I don't think we're really going to make much of an impact. But we need a supply of people who know, okay, I am a software builder. I don't need to know everything about secure coding, but I know I need to know enough to be able to go, hang on, I need help. So I think you're on the right track. However, you don't need a liability regime in order to get there, in my opinion. Okay. So there's a bunch of ways that you can fix a market, right? If it's broken markets all the time, there's things that happen, there's monopolies and so on. The, those are broken markets and you can fix them via a variety of interventions. You could use taxation, you could use a tort regime, mm -hmm. uh, you can use regulation. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways that you can interfere in that market. I believe that what the executive uh, order does, the new cybersecurity executive order does, is focuses on visibility in the market to try to change the, the economics of yeah. who has the information. That to me is the least intrusive thing you can do in the market and certainly something that you should try first before you go to a liability regime and start holding developers liable for the bad code they write, which is the, that's the end game of what you're proposing. Um, I remember you having a conversation with me about 2008 about the traffic light system, which is the observability part. Sort of like, yeah. you know, the- I don't remember that, but I well, believe it. You were basically saying the side of serial packets has like this panel of information and you were trying to design a panel of information for software that oh, yeah. more or less had the facts and then a red, green or amber type of signal to say this is- Well, that's, I mean, NIST is focused on implementing that part of the executive order right now. Mm. And OWASP should be involved. I mean, I think it's really a, a powerful, it's an amazing thing that they do. I started talking about that in 2000, and, before 2004. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's finally starting to come to fruition, which is uh, really exciting and really could change software. I mean, imagine if you went to sign up for your bank mm. and it had a big sticker on the screen somewhere that said, hey, this one is, uh, uh, a C, yeah, like like you see in the restaurants in New York City, that would be pretty amazing. I would probably move on, right? Yeah. Well, guess who's going to be secure right away? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, most of I'm... these most of these labels are for the software producers. Even if consumers don't look at them at all, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter because the the producers will be dramatically affected. But the big picture, I mean, let's zoom back out. Like, I, this is really about OWASP mission. And how does OWASP make a difference? Mm -hmm. You don't make a difference. I mean, people have been talking about getting security curricula into schools for decades. I've worked on curricula, like the one from Purdue. And, uh, you know, Sirius put one out a long time ago. It's, that's not a good leverage point. You've got to look for these force multipliers where you can really make a difference in the market. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, on that note, it's very challenging. I'll definitely have a think about that. I love actually having interviews where I actually come away with more questions than I started with. Um, Jeff, I think this illustrates exactly why you've got a distinguished lifetime membership. You've been an innovator for the entire time. You've really pushed the needle. I really do appreciate all the work you've done for OWASP, starting the top 10, the ASVS, the SAP, and a whole bunch of other things as well. Um, thank you for talking with us today, and uh, I look forward to your next 20 years of working with us. Thanks, Andrew. I really appreciate all the hard work you're doing because I know how hard that job is. <laughs> so yeah. thanks for, for dealing with all the all the things that come up as part of running a big volunteer organization. Absolutely. No worries. Anytime. Thank you.